So hello and welcome to this month's Hornby Magazine show. Now you know what that means, another month's rolled round and there's another edition of Hornby Magazine available to purchase right now at your local stores or on shop.keypublishing.com. You can also read the latest edition which is HM167, the May edition, right now on keymodelworld.com. Tony's Trains of Rugby is located at Hillmorton Locks on the outskirts of Rugby. We are open Tuesday to Saturday 10 till 5 but closing early on Saturday at 4 o'clock. We stock Hornby Backman, Graham Farish, Pico, Gage Master, Halgen, Oxford and Oxford Diecast, a Cure Scale and more. We also have a large selection of second hand models to suit all budgets. You can either visit us in store or reach me on 01788 543 442, visit our website tonystrainsofrugby.com or find us on Facebook. I wanted to focus this episode on creating realistic ballast and the start of the ground scenery here. So the focus has been in between episodes on getting the track ready. So after gluing the Pico Code 80 track down, I focused on getting the electrical jobs out of the way. So being a modular layout, I wanted it to come apart as easy as it goes together. So using these Model Tech Pro Track Aligners, I've installed them in between the, uh, the gaps of the various baseboards. So what I had to do was remove the track at either end of the edge of the baseboard. The already scenic side, I had to rip up the track and remove the ballast. The two main advantages to using Model Tech's Pro Track Rail Aligners is you can either connect your bus wires directly to them and then solder those to the track rails or you can use them simply as a clean break in between baseboards, as I've done. Once I've removed the scenery, I simply used some track pins to pin them down and then laid across the new pieces of track, removing the sleepers where necessary. I then went on to solder the rails directly to the Pro Track Rail Aligners using my DCC Concept soldering iron and then simply cut the rails and we had a very nice clean join. But there's no point having a nice clean track break on my modular baseboards if I'm not going to do the same with my bus wires. Luckily DCC Concepts has a solution to that with their Legacy Models PowerPoint dowels. First of all I mark the position for the dowels by drilling a pilot hole using a 3mm drill bit, remembering to keep it at 90 degrees the whole time. Then using a 19mm spade drill bit just to go deep enough for the dowel flange to sit flush with the baseboard ends. Now using a 13mm spade drill bit and working from the other side, drill straight through the board. You will now have a 13mm hole with a 19mm flange. Clean it up, ready for the dowel installation. I then went on to connect the bus wires using the crimp terminals provided. And once that was all in place, I pushed the boards back together and we have power track. And that brings me up to date to where we are right now with my Festiniog inspired 009 gauge layout. However, before I get on with the ballasting, I'm going to have a quick test slash play with the trains of the new track to make sure it works and to make sure all the trains clear the various bridges. <laughs> So moving straight on with the progress, the first stage of having realistic track is the painting and the ballasting of it. Now, back in 2020 for the Great Electric Train Show virtual exhibition, I went down to see Mike Buick of Oak Road, who had a very crafty method of painting and weathering track, of which I'm going to try and replicate here today. So using the same method that was on Oak Road, you can see here is my painted sample. And hopefully, you'll agree, it's quite realistic. So this method is actually extremely simple, and that's, I think, what's the most surprising part about it. Just like painting the bridges in the last episode. I'm going to use three colours. I'm going to start off with white, then move on to burnt umber, and then black. The three paints I've got are from the Hobbycraft acrylic paint range, although you can use anything in your collection. And what is actually surprising to a lot of people is we're actually going to paint the track before we ballast it. And I say paint it, we're going to dry brush it. So I'm going to pour out a bit of the white paint and we'll get started. So starting with a relatively small brush, I'm literally going to dip it into the white paint. 
wipe off the excess and then in true dry brush fashion rub most of it off and once most of it's off I'm going to start dry brushing the sleepers And that's us done with the first layer of colour. Now, don't worry too much, because as you can see on the final piece, the white really blends in. But what it does do is add a bit of highlight to the wood grain in the Pico sleepers. Right, let's move on to the burnt umber. The final colour is the Hobbycraft Black, same as before, tiny bit on the end of the brush, and away we go. And there we go, as simple as that, the track is now painted. And I think you'll agree, it's really highlighting the details in the sleepers. Once it's embedded in ballast, it'll look extra special. So in case you're wondering, these pieces of card I've put in, put in under the track next to the bridge sides, just to fill in the gap. So when I ballast next, um, I don't lose a ton of ballast down a crack. Also, <laughs> I knocked the track, so this bottle is just resting on a piece of track with some glue, um, ready for it to re-stick. So once this paint is dry, it's time to get on with ballasting. So for the ballasting phase, we'll need a few things, starting obviously with the ballast. Now I'm using Woodland Scenic Spine Ballast, and that's the gray blend. Now this is the smallest I could get, um, just because it's a smaller gauge of track, so therefore I don't want it to be too clumpy. We'll also need some isopropanol alcohol, a spray bottle, lots of PVA glue, and a bit of patience. Not forgetting a trusty brush to brush it all into place with. Right, you've all seen us ballast before, so straight into a montage, and I'll see you on the other side. So for the ballasting, I'm using a fairly traditional mix-up. I take some water and I want a roughly 50-50 
split between the water and the PVA glue. And that bottle apparently has a leak in it. So I'm using this little bowl because it has measurements on the side, so I can tell when I've got a 50-50 split. Probably making far too much. And then added to that, I always add a drop of washing up liquid. Then I stir it in with the paintbrush I was using earlier. First of all, I take the isopropanol alcohol and from a height, I spray down the ballast I'm intending to do. Now, you want to do it in small sections because this will dry very quickly. And when you're ready, simply take a pipette full of the glue. And what the alcohol does is it breaks the surface tension, stopping the glue sitting on top, meaning you'll, you won't get dry ballast underneath, which will then lift it up. So as you can see, I'm working rather speedily, but in essence, this is how you ballast. Very easy. I'm Alex Yates, and this is the Model Centre. We sell absolutely everything you can imagine in, in the popular scales. We've got our customization services, so you've got weathering, got renaming and renumbering, and then all the sort of add-ons, so like real coal, we can fit the parts pack for you, nameplates, cab crew, everything like that. You can order online or on the phone, come and collect it from us, or you can come to the door and we'll just serve you from there. And we're doing free postage on the website as well to, to sort of compensate for the fact that the shop's not open. So you can visit us on our website, themodelcentre.com. Our phone number is 01947 899 125. So while the ballast is drying, it's time to catch up on our journey on the Festiniog Railway.
So we're well on the way from Minforth. What can we expect next on the line? Right. Yeah, so as we leave uh, Minforth, we head straight out into the Welsh countryside, but it's a relatively short stretch of countryside this time before we're back into, into the village again, but this time the village of Penryn and passing on up through the station. Now, interestingly, it's called Penryn Station. Yeah. However, the village isn't called Penryn. No. no. Can you pronounce its actual name? It, it's Penryn and then some other words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, no, no, I can't, but I'm sure there's plenty of Welsh speakers watching who will be able to pronounce it for us. It's, it's a very difficult name to pronounce. I don't think we should pronounce it. I, I don't think we should. I think we'll, we'll probably offend some viewers <laughs> if we tried. So, we'll, we'll leave it be. <laughs> So as we leave Penryn Station, we swing quite sharply right over the main A road, which is still a traditional wooden gated crossing rather than modern barriers and lights, which is always nice to see. From then on, you continue to swing round slightly to the right, and then you come to quite a long straight, which has always been referred to as a 100 mile an hour straight. Now, that piqued my curiosity. Why is it yeah. called 100 mile an hour straight? Um, I assume it's from when the gravity trains used to come down and they gathered quite a bit of speed on that straight, or rather the brakemen let them gather quite a bit of speed on that straight. Never quite that, though, I'd imagine. <laughs> Slate wagon at 100 mile an hour, I don't really fancy it. <laughs> so, we started near enough at sea level down in Port Maddock. Obviously, we're no longer at sea level because it's becoming very picturesque. Yeah, so at this point, we're on, on 100 mile an hour straight, we actually cross into um, into Snowdonia National Park, we're over the actual border, uh, the boundary. Uh, so you do start to notice things getting more and more picturesque and more of a scenic vista, and it's um, you, you sort of seem, you seem to notice you're climbing more, even though we've been climbing constantly at 1480. It just seems more of a apparent that we're climbing for some reason, maybe because we're going to start curving quite a bit as well and the engines have to work harder when they're climbing on curves than when they're in a straight line. So now we're in this picturesque area, which is very much Festinog Railway, or what I know of it. Mm. What kind of elements can we take home to put in model railway form that would be, say, different to modelling another railway? So you've got things like the traditional slate walling, which is prominent in North Wales, really. But you've also got areas of the Festinog where it's it's like almost built on a slate embankment, which is um, quite unique. Really. I've not come across many other narrow gauge railways that have that kind of feature, which is a very distinctive Festinial trademark almost. I presume that's because of what's history with the slate mines. Yeah. Um, yeah. Plenty of it in abundance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Easy to get a hold of. It's like you see some of these railways that are built on shingle and things like that because the shingle was plentiful in the area. So it's all about all about your environment really, isn't it? Um, lots of slate. We'll use slate for embankments and things. <laughs> and of course it keeps that 1 in, 80, 1 in 80 gradient constant. Whereas if you 
just went with a layer of the land, you'd be going uphill and down dale, and you wouldn't be able to have the gravity trains, as it were. The rock cuttings must have been quite the architectural challenge, because obviously you've got the the sheer rock you have to cut through for the railway, but also the fact we're on the side of a mountain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it goes back to what we talked about earlier in the trip, about this, this shelf principle, and so you had to literally cut a shelf into the side of the mountain, um, which... The benefit of cutting a shelf in narrow gauge is it's not as big a shelf as it would have been for standard gauge trains. But it's still, you know, in, in this in this era, it's still pick and shovel and probably a bit of dynamite as well, which is dangerous but fun from what Navi's accounts were from the time. Uh, so you've got a, a real challenge on your hands to create that shelf atmosphere, but, and, and it leaves you these spectacular views, you know, spectacular view one way and a sheer rock face the other. From a modelling perspective, trying to, although it's just a rock face, there's so many colours, um, mainly probably from the lichen and things like that, yeah. um, that's on them. It'd be quite quite a fun challenge to try and replicate that in model form. Absolutely. You've also got the element of a lot of water running down the rock face, so you'll get areas that are, are really they're never dry. There's always kind of like a, a flow of water, so that's quite a challenge to re replicate that, I'd imagine. I suppose the joys of National Park Woodland in particular is there's lots of elements that we can try and recreate in model form. In particular, for example, the, the ground is very heavily covered in bracken, as we can see. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And you've got a lot of lovely old trees growing up as well, which is always nice to recreate in model form. And I know just the supply of those. So the bits I'm taking back with me visually are the various layers. So as we can see, in especially the woodland areas, it's not just grass. There's, like say, the bracken, you've got ferns everywhere, uh, fallen trees, debris, flowers, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, a little bit of wildlife in there as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's certainly not your classic sort of lawn sequence. It's very, very hilly, very undulating terrain, and lots of different types of foliage and things like that really to see. So a, re a real challenge for the model maker recreating this part of, of North Wales. So I was quite intrigued to learn of Whistling Curve that we're approaching very shortly. Mm -hmm. What is it? Uh, basically, Whistling Curve, as you get closer to Tanny Bolt, the railway switches back on itself several times really, and you go through a series of 180 degree curves, and Whistling Curve is, is the one nearest to Tanny Bolt, which is an incredibly popular area with, with photographers and, and filmmakers alike. Cause it's, it's not a massive walk from Tanny Bulk Station, but it's still not a walk to be taken on <laughs> unprepared, shall we say. And it, it's you've got some nice views of mountainous scenery in the background, and it's just, yeah, a very nice scenic location. And although it is quite scenic, it's not as easy to get the footage slash photos as we thought. Um, you can, yeah, it's, it's quite overgrown in places, and there's some quite serious drops as well, which if you're... A bit over eager, you can um, you can slide down the, the mountain and then have trouble getting back up again. As you did. As I did, yeah, yeah. But, um, I'm going to put in a clip now from earlier <laughs> when we were uh, filming the trains. When we were, yeah. <laughs> so here we are on site, and as you can see just behind me, just there, is what's called Whistling Curve. Now we're trying to get the uh, shot, and uh, there's no path to where we are. So we're in the. Uh, you can see there's Tony. Give us a wave. <laughs> We've clambered down at social distance, trying to get that shot. So we found a better shot on Whistling Curve, as you can see. It's a very nice shot, but uh, going one better. We've got Tony who's clambered down the side of this valley here to try and get the perfect photo. If it comes out, I'll show you it now. So as we go round Whistling Curve, it's worth noting that the photo that you actually then captured, along with the video, has made it into the latest issue of Formula Magazine, HM167. Yeah, that's right, that's my picture from our um, line-side exploration.
James Smith uh, and I'm the owner of yeah, Smith's Model Railways. We're based in uh, Sheringham in Norfolk, uh, just on the main high street. Really, really close to the North Norfolk Railway. So we stop from N-Gage to O-Gage. Brands like Pico, Graham Farish, uh, Hornby, Batman. Just launched uh, our new loyalty card uh, just after uh, lockdown when we reopened. So we also offer these uh, gift vouchers. You can either contact us via our telephone, uh, email, or with our contact form on our website. So the ballast is now rock solid, and the next step in the process is to paint the rail sides. Now you can see I've got a very uh, nicely used tub of rail match sleeper grime here, and using a small brush, I'm just going to paint the sides. And even at this early stage, you can already see how much of an improvement just painting the track is, um, as, it, as you can see on the left here, compared to the unpainted side on the right. So next on the list, I'm going to sort the ground scatter while the rail sides dry. So I've taken some soil from the garden, as you can see. I've stolen a saucepan from the kitchen, which is my modelling saucepan, and a sieve. And I'm just going to sieve it through to get all the fines out. And that will form the base of our ground scatter. So as you can see, we've been left with some larger rubbly bits, which to be fair, will make wonderful details for underneath trees and things. And then in the saucepan is the very fine soil. So next on the list, I'm going to add some tile and grout powder. Now I actually picked this tip up from Tim over at the scrap line. And what this does is it just lightens the soil up ever so slightly, which then means it's a better base colour to add colours to later on, such as these wooden scenic colours. So the next step before I add the ground scatter is just to paint the ballast with various washes. However, I need to let the rail sides dry first. So I'm just looking for smaller jobs I can do in between. And one that stands out like a sore thumb to me, particularly after my travels to the Festiniog, is there's no walls on this railway. So I'm going to use the Hornby Scaledale walling, which is pre-done, it's the right colour. And I'm going to try and get it on the line side. And hopefully when the scenery's in, that just adds a bit more interest. And before we glue it in, the most important step is to make sure your trains fit past the wall, which it doesn't. And the most important bit before we glue it all in is to make sure your trains go past the wall, which they do. So now the rail sides are dry, as I've been messing with those walls, it's time to get on with the next phase of the ballast painting. So as you can see, I'm adding a little bit of water to an old Oxford die-cast car lid. Now these are invaluable for little tubs to hold various liquids, glues, etc. And as you can see, I put a dab of water in it. The next one is to go back to that original acrylic paint. In, in this case, it's the burnt umber colour. I just want to add a couple of dabs. 
and using the wrong end of a brush, I'm going to stir that in and make myself a wash. So we've painted the sleepers and the rail sides now, but as you can see, the ballast is looking mighty clean for something that's been in constant use with engines going over it, etc. and being in all airs. So what we're going to do is take the uh, first colour, this is the brown wash, and just drip it over the ballast. So as you can see, I'm just adding drips now to the ballast. This just takes away the new shine to it all. Doesn't want to be a solid colour, i.e. you don't want to colour all the ballast as if you were putting the glue back on the ballast. This is because the real thing wouldn't be consistent. So while the brown is drying on the track, I'm now going to move on to the black acrylic. I'm just going to add it to the same pot, in an essence, add enough to turn this brown colour black. Now it's all going to mix in anyway on the ballast, so there's no harm in creating a new colour using the remnants of the last one. As you can see it sort of becomes a real gungy colour. Here we are with my third colour. This one is going to be much lighter, so a lot more water. And I want the base colour to be on the brown side. So with this third and final colour, I'm now just going to go back over the ballast and all the areas that haven't got any paint on them currently. I'm just going to make sure it has one coat of this. And there we go. I think you'll agree the track is starting to look much more realistic. Obviously it's still wet and it's got to dry. However, it's much better than a standard piece of track untouched. Right, while that's going to dry, I'm now going to move on to the ground scatter. So next we move on to one of my favourite bits, the ground textures and colours. Obviously here is the soil we prepared earlier in the garden. We've also got a host of Woodland Scenics fine turfs and coarse turfs. We've got the um, bigger fines that we picked out from the garden. So once the soil's down, the next step is to add some grass. Now we have the green scenes range here and we have a mix of summer, spring and straw. For that we'll be using a WWS static grass applicator with their layering spray. I then got one of my favourite products which is these Primo trees. Now I first saw Primo actually at Model Rail Scotland, I think it was back in 2019, seems a long time ago, but they have an absolutely fantastic range of trees and uh, we'll see more of them in a bit. Underneath the trees we've got things like the Little Leaf Company's leaf litter, um, which is very realistic, and we've also got some WWS forest ground cover, which if you can see that, is just that. Then I have a huge box of sea foam, which some of it is reclaimed actually off an old layout, so it's already got uh, leaves and things added to it, but this makes for very realistic bushing and it covers up all your mistakes. Right, so I'm getting way ahead of myself. The first step, of course, is to apply the soil. So first, taking some of the WWS basing glue, it's literally a case of pour it on the layout.
I wanted to incorporate some of the feel of slate being in the area. So using this WWS extra fine dark grey um, ballast, I think it is, just on the uh, points where the track raises up to the bridge, looking like a man-made embankment, I've used it there. And hopefully that just gives an indication, a signal that there's slate in the area of this model railway. So the scene is taking shape now. I've hoovered off the excess soil. Um, the slate coloured ballast is now drying. You can also see a test patch here on the left hand side of the static grass. So I'm happy with the colours. Before I do static grass, I'm just going to plan in where I'm going to put my trees and do those first because I'm not going to grass underneath the tree. Along with that, I'm also going to add this, which is the Woodland Scenics barbed wire fence. It's very finely detailed and brand new, so I thought I'd try it out. Of course, because we've got a cattle creep here, so there needs to be a fence somewhere along the line. So uh, I'm just going to go and have a play and see where it fits best. So next I fill the Woodland Scenics Accent Shaker with fine turfs for all the areas underneath the woodland. So next it's quite a fun stage. We should bring the layout a bit more to life. Now, I said earlier we're gonna use Primo trees. Now here is one. Now, when I first saw these, I was quite blown away because although it looks fairly standard for a tree, this is a birch tree, the main thing that I like about them is they're 100% handmade. So each one's individual, but also, if you can see this, they get the trunks right. There's not many trees out there where the trunks are correct, <laughs> in effect, and I just think that looks really good. So I've got a handful of these to place. I'm going to aim to put the tallest ones towards the back. So you can see there what an absolute difference a handful of trees makes to this scene, although it's quite bare on the ground for a woodland. So what I'm going to do now is remove the trees and start placing down the forest ground cover by WWS and also some of the bits we collected from the soil earlier. Yes, that turned into a bit of a palaver. <laughs> you forget how difficult it is to stack lots of trees at the same time without things to uh, lean them against. 
So going back to the scene, I think you'll agree it's starting to look very woodland underneath. The trick here is definitely blending and layers. So every time you add more scenery, particularly things like the forest cover, where the scale on its own would be a bit on the big side, um, I find the trick is to use the Woodland Scenics accent shaker and it just blends everything in. The final touch now for this area is I'm going to using a bit of, well I can't use PVA glue because I'm using the bottle to hold up the trees, but I might use a bit of Woodland Scenics basin glue and just stick some of the sea foam trees. I'm going to cut this up and just dab them around just to really blend it in. Well, although a bit messy, and obviously there's still lots of glue there, I think it's just starting to take shape now, and you could quite believe that it's bang in the middle of the countryside. So you can just see I've done the bushes behind the walls and I've added some of the WWS paper ferns which are quite effective actually, they stand out quite a mile. So I'm really happy with how this has come out so far but for now I'm going to let the glue dry and I'm going to hand you over to Mike in the Hornby Magazine workshop for this month's bumper crop of new additions. I'm Anthony of AGL Model Row Store in Leighton Buzzard, Bedfordshire. We stock the whole ranges for N, O, and O, all the major brands for DC modelers and DCC modelers. We have a full DCC sound install, which can include sound, smoke, and lights. We offer a range of Pico 009 exclusives, and we are also UK's biggest importer of Batman USA Thomas and Friends models. We've got great links to the M1, we have mail order, which you can order through the website www.agrmodelrowstore.co.uk. We're actually just off the Lake Buzzard High Street. We're in High Street News. So if you look for Costa Coffee, directly opposite, you can see us and the sign. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to Top of the Dale for the new arrivals section of the Hornby Magazine Show. On the layout today, we've got a selection of the latest editions which arrived either before the latest issue of Hornby Magazine, that's issue 167, our May 2021 issue, or just new additions to our own collections. So starting from the front, we've got a pair of GBRF livery class 20s for double O gauge. Now these are the Railroad Plus versions from Hornby, modelling 2905 and 2901. 2905 arrived in time for our latest issue, while 2901 just arrived just after we went to press. But nevertheless, we could show the pair of them into here together on the layout today. They've got eight pin decoder sockets and also space for sound inside as well, if you wish. Next behind the class 20s, we've got Helgen's brand new double O gauge class 86 slash O. This all new model from Helgen for its double O gauge range models the locomotives in their original condition as they were delivered from 1965 and follows through to their BR Blue Career 2. Inside it's got a 21 pin decoder socket and space for a speaker as well, plus it's got directional lighting and a 5 pole motor as well. Continuing the electric theme we've got a Backman Class 90, but this one's been relivered in Grand Central Black and Orange. It joins a rake of Mark IV carriages in the same livery, and in the latest issue of Hornby magazine, John Pilgrim shows how he's repainted a set of Hornby Mark IV carriages in that new Grand Central Black and Orange colour scheme. We've got a full step-by-step -step guide showing how John Pilgrim went about repainting these coaches to create the authentic rake you see here. Sticking with the modern image theme, we've got the new JSA steel coil carriers from Acuriscale. Acuriscale has gone into great detail with these wagons, and you can read our full review in the latest issue of Hornby magazine, which talks about those differences. On the layout today, we've got three different versions of the JSA. We've got the original British steel blue version with telescopic sliding hoods. 
We've got a VTG silver set with the same hoods, although there are modifications to those as well. And we've got a set without hoods at all, which are those that have been modified most recently to be used on steel coil traffic. More modern traction, but slightly bigger this time. We've got Revolution Train's first O-gauge model in the layout today, which is an exclusive commission from Helgen for a Class 37.4 in Direct Rail Services Compass livery. It models 37.405, and I'm sure you'll agree, it looks absolutely superb in this really striking modern traction era livery. Also with a modern traction theme, but slightly earlier, we've got a pair of Hornby's Intercity liveried HST power cars. These stand out from the more common appearance of the HSTs by having buffer beams at each end of the units as well. These are the power cars which were modified in the late 1980s and early 1990s to be used as surrogate DBTs on the East Coast Main Line, whilst the route was waiting arrival of its new Mark IV carriages and driving van trailers. They're finished as 43065 City of Edinburgh and 43123 in matching intercity colours. Another exciting addition on the layout today is Helgen's Class 25-3 for double gauge. This brand new addition here today is finished as D7647 in BR two-tone green with small yellow warning panels, but there are plenty of other livery choices and locomotive numbers to choose from too. Within that collection, you've got BR green and BR blue versions, as well as pair in the ethyl format as well. So that's electric train heat X locomotives, which were converted for use on trains in Scotland. Moving back in time, we've got Hornby's latest version of the A23. Now this model 60512 steady aim in BR line green with early crests, but there are further versions coming too, modeling these locomotives in late BR livery as well as LNER lined apple green as well. Highlights include an 8 pin decoder socket, a 20 space for a 28mm round speaker, a 5 pole motor and plenty of power to call scale length trains. Completing this month's new arrival section, we've also got a brand new model of GT3 on the layout. Now this is a final production model, it's my own product which has arrived here in the workshop for testing and it's sound fitted too. You can expect a video on that locomotive coming up on keymodelworld.com in the coming days. I should mention as well that all of these locomotives, apart from GT3, are featured in the latest issue of Hornby magazine. Now, if you want to read our review of GT3, you have to look back at issue 163. That was our January 2021 issue. However, in the latest issue, like I say, all of these are reviewed in full, plus we've got videos coming of all of these models on keymodelworld.com in the coming days. That brings me to the end of the new arrival section, so I'll hand you back to Richard and the Festin Yield Railway. I'm uh, Adam Davis of uh, Rails of Sheffield Limited. We're a family run business, we've been trading for over 50 years now. We've also been voted retailer of the year for the last two years running. We sell any age, any gauge, tens of thousands of items for all man major manufacturers, continental, American, from you know your N gauge, Z gauge, right up to live steam, right on. We do many in house exclusives, uh, all available on our website, railsofsheffield.com. The address here is 21 to 29 Chesterfield Road, Sheffield, SA0RL. So I've had some great fun this month putting this month's episode of the Hornby Magazine show together. Hopefully you've learned something along with me learning something. I'm particularly pleased with the painting of the track method that's gone down really well and the start of the scenery. Now it's just a case of improving it. So next month, what do we have to look forward to? Well, I'll be tackling trying to create a realistic, fast-flowing river, as seen in North Wales. I'll be adding details to the cattle creep, such as the cattle and the people. And I'll finally get a chance to show you how I'll be putting the green scenes static grass to good use here on the front of the layout. And hopefully, I'll have the whole thing finished up, tidied up, and uh, looking a darn sight better than it did. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget you can buy the latest Hornby magazine, that's HM167. Right now it's in the shops, or you can see it on Key Model World, which includes the step-by-step -step guides to how I painted this very bridge. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye for now.
Sing for the Dillin, a kissing comfort Dillin, where she be no fun, they be up to the bay. 